Good morning, everybody. I'm with Brett King, this man mm -hmm. here. He'll be on stage in five minutes' time. Get I hope you're now. ready. As quickly as you can, please. It's going to be awesome. We're going to rock, rock your world. Thank you. Tobacco Care. Good morning, everybody. I hope you're uh, looking forward to the day. Are you excited about today? Yes? Uh, I can't hear you. Are you excited about today? Fantastic. Uh, I'm now going to uh, begin the day with an amazing man called Brett King. He's spoken in more than 50 countries, more than a million people. He's even been an advisor at the White House on banking. I'll emphasize that that was after the financial crash and not before it. Uh, his Amazon books, um, he's been ba uh, voted Banker of the Year. He's a best-selling author. He speak he's done stuff for Wired. I've been speaking to him backstage. He's absolutely awesome. So please welcome Brett King to the stage. How are you, Monty? Good, Good luck, baby. You. Hey, just wait before you go. Before yeah. you go. Before you go. Hi, guys. Let's just selfie. do a selfie. Okay. Dude. You have to smile. Let me get this right. Say hello, everybody. Hello, everybody. Awesome. Actually, I should have said say hello me or something. I don't know. I was at dinner with these guys last night, and they were trying to convince me that the Arabic word for a smartphone was iPhone, right? But uh, who's got an iPhone here? Okay, cool. So are you guys excited to meet Steve Wozniak? You know I'm not Wozniak, right? <laughs> but he's coming, don't worry. Um, and who's got a Samsung? Anyone got a Galaxy Note? You know those things blow up, right? So if anyone put their hand up, then you might just want to move aside, I don't know. Anyway, I'm going to talk to you guys about the future today. And uh, I do get into a little bit of the banking stuff, but don't worry, it's still cool. Um, but in terms of sort of the future and this technology, technology has a huge impact on our lives today. You know, we just did a selfie there, but you know, you guys probably are tweeting this session out or you're putting stuff on Facebook. These are some of the behavioral shifts that we've made as a result of introducing this technology into our lives. So the real question is, how is this technology going to change our life going forward? That's what I'd like to talk to you guys about today. But you know, technology is cool. Technology has this impact on us in terms of the way we live that's uh, really sort of changing uh, society from a day-to-day -day perspective. Let's see if this is working. Okay, good. Now, this is, uh, this is people lining up, waiting for an uh, iPhone in, uh, in London. Got some audio feed there. Then we've got, uh, in China, people stacking up. So it doesn't matter which culture you're from, technology is so cool, people will camp outside of an Apple store to get the latest gadget. But do you ever see people camping outside of a bank, trying to get a bank account open? Well, actually, this is people camping outside of a bank in the UK, in, uh, in London. Do you know what it was for? It wasn't for a new product. They were, they were trying to get their money out because they thought the bank was going to go, go under, right? So, so that's about the only time people camp outside of a bank. <laughs> but you know, when we look at this technology, one thing that we can be certain is over the last 250 years, as new technologies ca have come into play, they've been quite disruptive. Now, this was big technology back 200 years ago. This was the steam machine powering a weaving loom or a textile factory. And you see this young child who was suddenly put in charge of running this machine. But in 1812, this was very disruptive technology. It resulted in the loss of jobs, thousands and thousands of jobs in the UK at the time. Now, the two biggest employers in the UK at that time were textiles and agriculture. So you can imagine how disruptive this technology was. So as these steam machines started to be put in factories, and you know, these kids started operating them, what would happen is people would come in, the textile workers would come into these factories and they'd smash up the steam machines with a sledgehammer, they'd try and burn the factories down. And uh, we came to call these people Luddites. I don't know if you've heard that term before. 
Now, the Luddites were sort of run by this fictitious character. We used to call him King Ludd or General Ludd. We don't know if he was actually a real person, but this was such disruptive technology at the time that it really, really resulted in a massive political shift. But today we see similar things happening. These are the Luddites of the 21st century. These are taxi drivers losing their job as a result of the Uber app, this technology that's changed the way we've ordered taxis. Now, 200 years have gone past, and it seems that technology, even though we love technology, still has a disruptive effect on society. So while it's great that we have an iPhone and while it's great we have access to all this technology, sometimes it'll impact the way we work and some people lose jobs. The difference between the steam machine and the computer chip and what's happening with Uber right now is the shift in employment patterns and the shift in the way we work and live is a little bit nuanced. When Uber came along, they didn't redesign the taxi. They didn't change the technology of the car. What they did is they changed the way we thought about a journey. Have you guys used Uber to order a taxi, right? So you, you can now just take your phone out of your pocket and you can say, uh, you know, pick me up, and you can see the driver coming to you on the map. Now that was an innovation that Uber put into the design of the app. They also changed the way you pay for a taxi. So you, know, you get to your destination, you don't have to worry about finding your purse or your wallet or a credit card or cash because you just use the app. But there was another part of this that's quite interesting. In uh, the US, Uber employs over a million drivers on a full-time basis. It's a big, big employer in the United States. But 30% of Uber's drivers in cities like New York had never had a bank account. Now, this is a problem because they used to drive yellow cabs and get paid in cash, and now Uber's saying you need a bank account, a plastic card to get paid. So how did Uber fix this problem? So what they did is Uber said, well, we need to make it easy for drivers to get a bank account. So in the driver app, when you sign up as a driver for Uber, they allow you to sign up for a bank account. In doing so, Uber became one of the largest banks in the, in, in the United States for small business, for small business entrepreneurs. We call it acquirer in banking language. They became one of the largest acquirers of small business bank accounts. Now, you probably don't think of Uber as a bank, but they had to enable access to banking services to fix this problem of recruiting drivers. And this is a good indication of the sort of design changes we're seeing as a result of technologies like Uber. Banking and other you know, payment services and things like that are becoming integrated into our life because of the technology of smartphones. We'll soon have augmented reality glasses and all of these sorts of things that will integrate technology into our lives more fully. So what sort of impact is this going to have on society? This is a graph showing you the impact of the tractor or the combustion engine on the farming sector. In the, in the late 1800s in the United States, between 70 and 50% of the labor force in the US was employed in farming. Today, that's a, less than 2% of the US workforce. So you can see the blue line is the number of tractors in the US, and the red line is the number of people working in farms. This is pretty destructive technology. Where did all those jobs go? All those people who are put out of work by, fact, uh, by uh, combustion engines, by tractors, did that, were they just out of work? Well, many of them went into uh, factories and automation and things like that. So the big disruptive technologies we're looking at down the pipe, the big four disruptive technologies that will affect our society globally over the next 20 years, start with automation. Start with artificial intelligence and robotics. Now, AI has made some real leaps and bounds the last few years. We don't have artificial general intelligence yet. We sort of talk about three categories of AI. We talk about machine intelligence, artificial general intelligence. This is where you, know, you have a computer that can mimic a human or is as smart as a human. And then we have hyper-intelligent computers. So computers will be smarter than humans. But we're at the machine intelligence stage right now. That is, we have computers that can do specific tasks better than humans. Do you know some of those tasks that they can do? 
Well, one of them is the example of IBM Watson. IBM Watson is a, an AI, a machine intelligence, built by IBM. And they've applied this not just to playing the uh, game show Jeopardy, but to now diagnosing cancer. So if you look at the cancer research industry in the United States and globally, this is millions of dollars going to cancer research. They taught Watson to understand the medical research around cancer and oncology. So it can suck in 25 years of research papers and medical journals and synthesize all of that information in a second to give a diagnosis. What that means is today, Watson is 97% accurate at diagnosing cancer. Sounds pretty good. Do you know how accurate the average doctor is in the United States for diagnosing cancer? 50%. So Watson is almost twice as accurate as the best human doctors in diagnosing cancer. That's pretty wild. Now think about that. If you went to your doctor and your doctor suspected that you might have cancer, would you absolutely insist on seeing a human doctor to get your diagnosis? Or now that you know that, would you be prepared for an artificial intelligence to give you a diagnosis? It's interesting, isn't it? We're going to come to trust machines because machines will give better advice than humans very soon. This is going to change the way we think of the world. We used to say humans were better. The human factor, that human connection was what we needed. But once we understand that machines are actually better performing in terms of giving advice, this may change the way we think about society. Now, when uh, we in infuse all of this technology into our world, it changes the way we live. Today, we use social networks, we use our smartphone, we use technology like this, and it's changed our behavior. How many times a day do you check your smartphone? Facebook, you know, check your email. Probably 100 times a day or more. But before 2007, before the iPhone came along, you probably weren't doing that. Before Facebook came along, you definitely weren't doing that. So this has already changed our behavior. But as technology gets cheaper and smaller and smarter and becomes infused in our cars and our homes and all of these sorts of things, technology will just be all around us. But it'll change the way we experience life. It'll change the way we get diagnosed for medical conditions. It'll change the way it measures our performance. It'll change the way we communicate. As this technology is embedded in the world, it will change the way we design the world and experiences around us. It'll, so that's the second disruptor, embedded technology. The third disruptor is uh, gene technology and health technology. So we talked about IBM Watson, but one of the really exciting developments in the future is gene editing. Now, I don't know whether you've heard about this technology, but we can take the DNA out of your cells right now, and we can sequence your DNA, then what we can do is we can edit it, like a so software program, like a piece of data. We can edit your DNA inside your cells. Then what we do is we reload that into a viral vector, a virus, basically, inject that back into your body. And as your immune system attacks that virus, it absorbs the corrected DNA. This is Layla Richards. She's the first human ever to be cured of a genetic disease as a result of gene editing. This uh, genetic disease she had was acute lymphoblastic leukemia, a form of cancer, genetic cancer. And by changing her DNA, she was cured of this previously incurable disease. Now think about things like uh, Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, cystic fibrosis, hemochromatosis, uh, breast cancer. All of these are genetic diseases that get passed down from your parents to you through your genes. In 20 years' time, we'll just edit those diseases out of your DNA, like a bad software bug. How's that going to change the medical industry? How's that going to change the pharmaceutical sector? This is going to be very disruptive technology. So when you combine these three areas, artificial intelligence and robotics, gene editing, embedded technology, what you'll end up with is smart cities, smart economies that are based on technology as the differentiation. And, you know, we're starting to see investment in these sorts of technologies happen all around the world. But in the Middle East, things like uh, new infrastructure, 
um, energy systems, all of this is happening in this region as well. So um, actually one of those uh, major disruptive technologies of the smart infrastructure is solar energy. They just, they just signed a new contract in the United Arab Emirates for solar generation of electricity at 2.6 cents per kilowatt hour. Now this probably doesn't mean much to you guys, but in the United States on average, based on coal plants, the US pays 6 cents per kilowatt hour to generate electricity. So this is almost a third of that price today we're signing solar contracts. So here's a really interesting thing. If you're an economy based on coal generation or natural gas electricity generation in 10 years' time, you'll be falling behind the rest of the world because your electricity costs will be 10 times that of an economy based on renewables. And you'll have increased healthcare costs from the pollution, you know, let's not even talk about climate change. So this is going to be extremely disruptive technology. But as we sort of throw all this in the mix, and we think about these changes, then how's that going to change the way society works? Well, automation and robotics and artificial intelligence are going to be massive changes for our society. Bigger than the internet, bigger than the invention of the computer, bigger than the steam machine, if we think about these disruptive technologies that we've seen over the last 250 years, nothing's even come close to the disruptive power of AI. And that's a big deal. Do you know, if you look back over all of those technology changes we've seen in 250 years, one of the things that emerges is really interesting. How many businesses have survived the introduction of a disruptive technology like the internet or the steam machine, for example, with their business model intact? Zero. So how many industries are going to be affected by the introduction of artificial intelligence? Pretty much all of them. So this is Eva, Ava from a movie called Ex Machina. I don't know whether you've seen it. But this is how science fiction depicts these robots that we see in sci-fi. It's either that or it's the Terminator that's going to come and uh, uh, take, you, take over the world. Just a, just a tip on that, um, just be kind to robots. You never know what's going to happen in the future, OK? <coughs> so this is what um, you know, science fiction thinks robots looks like. But this is actually what robots look like today. They're not quite at the Ava, Ava stage right yet. But robots are going to be very commonplace within just a few years. By 2035, there's going to be more robots on the planet than humans. Did you know that? So what, what is the most common form of robot you're going to see in the future? Well, you might see robots like this. This is Amazon's uh, automated drone fleet that they're working on. They're testing this in, in the UK and the US right now. 80% of Amazon's deliveries fall under the weight category of five pounds in the US uh, measurement system. And these drones would be capable of delivering those goods and services. So what they're how this is probably going to work is you're going to have automated trucks that drive around, and the drone will fly off the truck, deliver the parcel to your door, and then connect back on the truck. Or they'll have uh, hubs around the city that will, this will do. So this is going to be pretty interesting. We're going to see these drones flying around all over the place. Um, we're also going to see probably the most common form of robot that we'll see around the world will be actually autonomous vehicles, self-driving cars. That's a form of robot, right? Um, but we're also going to be introducing robots into things like surgery. This is the STAR robot, the smart tissue autonomous robot. And this is capable of outperforming surgeons in doing sutures 19 out of 20 times. It's better than the best doctors. Why? Because it's learned to suture based on the best doctors. It's mimicked them. And this is the big shift that we've seen recently, is machines are starting to learn. And they can learn by observing humans and copying us. But then they start to improve on that model. So that's pretty interesting. Um, so machines are no longer just programmed. Now they actually learn behavior. And this is a, a big change. This is what's going to enable AI to progress. But it's not just smart cars or autonomous vehicles in the, uh, on the roadways. We're going to have smart ships. And uh, here's where smart economies will have to adapt. You, you're going to have to provide infrastructure 
to support these sort of mechanisms or quickly your economy is going to fall behind. Now, if you look in uh, countries like the United States right now, there's a lot of political turmoil in the US. Oh, goodness, I hope Trump doesn't get in next week, I tell you what, but I live in New York, it's just it's crazy. Crazy to think that he's got this far, but anyway, I hope, you know, anyway, let's not get into the politics. But in the US, it's very fashionable for Trump to talk about bringing back big coal and bringing back, uh, you know, automotive production to, uh, um, you know, Detroit and things like that. But the reality is the US hasn't invested in infrastructure infrastructure that would support the smart economy. They're behind China and India on solar investment. They're behind in terms of uh, infrastructure investment for the smart economy. The only thing that might save the US is Silicon Valley, which has uh, created this incredible wealth of innovation. But you guys have to make a choice here in, in Beirut and Lebanon. Are you going to be a smart economy? That's this is, in 20 years' time, unless you invest in this type of infrastructure, then it's going to be a challenge. So let's talk about banking a little bit. Let's sort of say, okay, well, if we were going to redesign the world of banking based on all of these technologies going to impact us, what would that look like? And how is that going to change the way we live with, with uh, banking and our money in the future? Now, first principles is the concept that Elon Musk uses for uh, SpaceX and Tesla. He said, you know, we don't design a rocket based on the technology of 1950s or 1960s. If we're going to design a rocket, let's start from scratch and design it based on the technologies we have today. So in 2045, what is banking going to be like? Well, the main thing you'll notice about banking in 20 years' time is that it's just going to be all around you. You won't have to think about it. You won't have any physical artifacts. There'll be no plastic cards. There'll be no checkbooks. Most of you will never use cash in 20 years' time, never physical money. And banking will just be turned on, available for you in your devices, whether that is a smartphone or the next generation of that, or augmented reality glasses, or embedded in artificial intelligence in the world around you. So it'll respond to your needs, whether that, you know, if you walk into a store and you want to, you know, get your groceries, for example, but you don't, um, you don't have enough money in your bank account, you'll get access to credit as you walk in the store, rather than having to wait till you get to the point of sale, swiping your debit card, and having the transaction declined, and then having to find your credit card. When you walk in the store, your bank will say, looks like you need a little bit of extra money for your groceries today. Can we help you with that? It'll be contextual. The other part of this is it'll be experiential, but the advice will be a core component of the trust that we put in banking. So, what, you know, rather than ask you for advice on investment products, in the future, one of the big things will be you just be able to ask your phone for advice about money. Like, hey Siri, can I afford to go out for dinner tonight? And it'll be able to tell you that. That's the sort of advice that's useful, that will help you in your day-to-day -day management of your money. And this is the type of ecosystem that we'll start to build. But voice is going to be a strong component of this, not just in banking, but also in commerce. Now, I don't know if you've, uh, do you guys watch uh, Saturday Night Live? That, uh, have you seen that before? Alec Baldwin, you know, he's been doing these Donald Trump impressions. It's quite good, actually. But he's also recently been working with Amazon, talking about this new technology called Amazon Echo or Amazon Alexa. I don't know whether you've seen this device before. This is the device you put in your home, and you can talk to Alexa. And I've got Alexa at my place. I can turn on my lights in my house. I can set the temperature on the thermostat. I can order an Uber. I can, uh, you know, um, do all this stuff. I can check what the temperature is going to be. I can put stuff on my calendar. I can set an alarm. And as this technology matures over the next 10 years, this embedded artificial intelligence is going to be a big deal. In 10 years' time, some of the biggest new technology companies will be based on what we call smart assistants or AIs embedded in our home. But if you haven't seen Alexa, let Alec Baldwin introduce you to this technology. Yeah. You're okay. He's okay. He made it. Jason, what do you mean? We were very bad boys. Alexa, what's in the news? Here's the news. Alec Baldwin and Jason Schwartzman were seen mooning paparazzi. Baldwin oh. threw a shoe at photographers before making a run for it. My poor cashmere socks. Alexa, reorder another pair of Bresciani's. Reordering Bresciani sauce. Okay, listen, can you send some lawyers or something? 
Oh. Alec. It's a pretty good ad, right? Now, did you notice the moment when Alec conducted commerce using his voice? What did he order? Do you remember? Socks, right. He said, Alexa, reorder me a pair of Bresciani socks. These are like $200 cashmere socks. They're incredible, right? I don't have any, by the way. But, um, but he just ordered using his voice. Now, imagine how this is going to change the way we think about banking products and services. Right now, today in a bank, we uh, promote things like credit cards and debit cards. Now, credit cards, the way we've promoted credit cards in the past is we said, you get this credit card, and the more you spend, the more airline miles we'll give you. Right? And it's geared towards that. So um, how much do you think the airline miles that Alec Baldwin gets on his credit card influenced his decision of which payment method he used for Alexa? It didn't at all, because it's automated. And so this is really means we're going to have to rethink the concept of a payment vehicle, a debit card or a bank account, and the way it will integrate into our life. Those things that used to be important, that used to get people to use your cards, that won't matter in this world. Because once you've linked a card to Amazon, that's it. You're not going to, he's not going to say, oh, uh, you know, um, which, uh, which card am I going to use, Alexa? Reorder me the brush shiny socks, but uh, choose the card with the highest airline miles. It's not going to work like that, right? It's going to be highly automated. So this is going to change the way we think about bank products and services as well. But n not only giving you advice in terms of your financial health, but your bank account will help you to make smart purchase decisions. When you combine this with AI, this is how something might work. You might say to... Uh, Siri on your phone, hey Siri, can I afford to go out for dinner tonight? And Siri would say, yes, but only if you spend under 100 US dollars. And you say, all right, find me a great uh, Chinese fusion, Asian fusion restaurant that I can go to for under $100. And it will book the restaurant for you based on that. So this technology will just be embedded. When you go to the restaurant, you'll go and eat, and then you'll leave the restaurant. You won't have to pay because your agent on your phone, your AI built into your phone, will look after all of that seamlessly. This is the technology we'll be working with. Facebook, Google, Apple, they're all working on these smart assistant technologies. It's going to be very, very big over the next five to ten years. But it's not just you know, this uh, AI component. The real trick around banking and money will be lowering friction. So for example, when you come to a new country, that you haven't visited before. If you go to London, for example, you know, you go to London and you know you want to get a taxi, you've got to have cash for most of the taxis. They have these, they have the contactless terminals in the taxis now, but the taxi drivers don't like using them. So they, they pretend they're not working, right? So you've got to have cash. The problem is if you've just hop, hopped off a plane, then you know you, you haven't gone to an ATM, you don't have cash, it's always a problem. But in the future, it doesn't matter where you go in the world, your phone will be able to just work that out for you, or your technology that you have will just be able to work out how to pay. If I want to send you some money, I'll just put in, I owe you $50, and I, I you know, use my phone with a gesture or something, and bang, you got $50. I won't have to ask what your bank account number is or what the address of the branch is. It'll all be seamless. The friction will have been removed from the system. You know, there's over 21,000 fintech companies in the world today 21 billion dollars invested in fintechs last year and every fintech is trying to do the same thing right now is take friction out of the banking and finance ecosystem so when we think about all these changes that are coming in the world uh, around us then how's it going to change the way you uh, live your life identity is going to be a big portion of that your identity may change based on the type of interactions you have in the past, we used to measure identity based on your date of birth and where you lived, you know, your address and identity markers like this. But in the future, your behavior will be your identity, not your identity document. Your behavior will identify you as a unique person. So even if someone steals your driver's license or knows your date of birth or knows where you live or in the US, your social security number, the fact that their behavior doesn't mimic you will protect you from fraud in the future. This is a very important development because fraud is skyrocketing right now, identity theft in particular, because the old identity mechanisms that we use, date of birth, address, 
those sorts of data points are really no longer securable. We can't make those secure. So we have to use something else. So we use uh, facial recognition, biometrics, voice recognition. We use all of these technologies as well as heuristics, your behavior, to really figure out who you are. Now, this changes our ability to automate, right? And when you think about automation, you might think of something like this. This is Elon Musk's uh, Tesla factory in, uh, in California. And he's now building the Giga factory in Nevada. But you notice there's no humans on the factory floor here. Do you know why? Elon Musk says it's very simple. He said if he puts humans on the factory floor, they slow the factory down to human speed. So at robot speed, or based on automation, they can produce cars a lot faster than having humans on the production line. And think about things like healthcare, or banking, or many of these service industries where humans are involved today. We'll take humans out of that because we'll be able to deliver revenue and products much faster in real time on a smartphone than having a human involved. A human will just add friction in the future. A human will just slow things down. Now you might say, yeah, but what if I want human contact? You know, I, th I think the driver for efficiency and access to services in the moment, when you need it the most, will actually be a stronger driver than uh, human contact in the future. So how do we get to 2045? What's going to happen over the next couple of decades? Well, it starts with a change to the way we think about these sorts of industries, banking, energy, all of these you know, telecoms. We're going to have to change the underpinning regulations. Now, there's in, uh, here in, in, in Lebanon, there's a little bit of, uh, the, the regulator's a little bit slow in respect to some of these changes. Um, because they, there's a little bit of, like, we've got to look after our banks that are here. But actually, if you look at London and Singapore and some of these other markets, they're rushing to engage fintech. London has made a big call of saying they're the most advanced fintech economy. And they create these sandboxes or areas for these fintechs to play so that they can actually try and prototype new, uh, new types of financial services or new companies that can sometimes even break regulation, but they allow them to do that in sort of a secure environment or a test environment. And all these regulators now are sort of rushing to get fintechs to invest in their economy. Why? They understand that smart economies will have technology-based financial services in the future. In fact, the leading banks and financial service companies, the leading healthcare companies, the leading agricultural companies will all be technology first in the future. This is the key. And we're starting to see a shift towards experience design. Just like Uber changed the experience of the journey of a taxi, we're starting to change the context of banking in our lives. So you've got companies like Acorns that allow you to invest just a few cents every day. They round up your purchases and put that in an investment account. You've got Apple Pay, which allows you to tap your phone or tap your watch. Android Pay, Samsung Pay. We now can use our phone instead of having to use plastic. And you've got companies like a firm, Max Levchin, who used to be with PayPal. He's got this startup now. When you walk into a store, you can get access to credit in the store. You don't need to apply for a credit card in advance. You can do it right there in the store. So what we're doing is we're taking bank products and services, and we're turning them into experiences embedded in your life that solve a problem for you in the moment. This is the shift in design thinking that we're, we're doing. But you know, you might say, but isn't advice important? Isn't the human still important? This, you know, this is where humans can differentiate, right? When you need advice on a mortgage or an investment product, but we're actually learning that humans are no longer the best at advice. Let me illustrate it this way. This is what the Google self-driving car sees through its bank of sensors as it's driving around uh, California and other locations. The LiDAR and the camera suite that they have in an Uber vehicle or in uh, the Tesla vehicle now, or Google smart driving car, they can capture a thousand times the information that your eye can capture when you're driving. A thousand times. And they can make a decision 50 times faster 
than your neocortex. So what is inevitable is this. Within 10 to 15 years, autonomous vehicles will outperform human drivers without exception. So think about 2030, maybe 2035 at the latest, maybe even before the end of next decade. Can you imagine going to London and human drivers are banned from the city centre because humans are too risky? This is statistically a very strong possibility. Now, you know, I'm sure if you guys have been in the Beirut traffic this morning, it probably is not a bad idea, right? to have uh, autonomous vehicles. But then think about what you're going to do in an autonomous vehicle that drives itself. You, what are you going to do? Well, you can probably check your Facebook status and do some selfies, I don't know. <coughs> so the thing is, machines are quickly becoming smarter than humans. And the best advice in the future will come from machines because they can synthesize more information to make a decision. That's why machines will outperform humans. See, even the best human advisors that have years and years of experience, they don't know all of the data. They, uh, they've forgotten things that they've learned in the past. They may not have access to the right information. They may not know your behavior. But the machines in the future that learn this will be able to combine all of that information to give you advice in real time based on you individually in terms of how you live your life. Now, we've been applying this to the startup that I built in New York called Movin. And Movin is a downloadable bank account. You download this app, it takes you two minutes to sign up for a bank account, and then you can use your phone and tap it on a, on a point of sale terminal using Apple Pay or Samsung Pay later that day. Um, the idea behind this was to create a bank account that actually gives you advice to help you save money. And our users of uh, Movin, and we're in three countries right now, in Canada, in the United States, and in New Zealand, on average, people that use our app save $150 more per month than their counterparts who don't use Movin, who just have a typical bank account. So this is when you have advice embedded day to day, and you can see the real-time receipts you get. It shows you whether you're tracking above or below. And the app will uh, help you save by sending a message to your watch saying, hey, you're $200 below your typical spending. Why don't you save that money today? So this is how the context of advice in a real-time world can be implemented. And our savings product is about got about a 40% conversion rate when you use the smartwatch or the smartphone. It says, hey, how much do you want to save today? Versus a typical savings account for a bank which has about 1% or 2% conversion rate. Just by surfacing that message in real time on a watch or on the phone. This is a major in, uh, change or improvement to the way we think about it. Now, when we offered the savings account, we didn't even offer an interest rate, but just because of the ease of use of moving money from your, into your savings account, people adopted it. We also have robo-advisors now working on investment. So robo-advisors are able to manage your portfolio based on an algorithm or artificial intelligence, and they can outperform the market and outperform humans consistently based on those algorithms. So robo-advisors are going to change the way we invest. And uh, when we think about all of these new technologies that are coming together, we realize that as you include automation in the business, then the real measure of a bank or a financial services company in the future is whether you can deliver a product in real time on the phone. But to do that, you have to eliminate something that's been around for three or 400 years and that's the signature. You know, when you go to a bank today, you know you have to sign all of these forms, right? When I uh, applied for a mortgage in uh, the US, I had to sign 17 different pieces of paper to apply for a mortgage. Now, in the future, we won't use the signature. Do you know why? Well, first of all, it's not secure. But it turns out that one of the things that we do today in banking is really, really bad for both customers and banks. And that is, we require customers to come into a bank branch and identify themselves face to face using a driver's license or something like that. But it turns out that's very, very risky. I'll tell you why. When we go into a customs, uh, I don't know if you guys have been to Dubai recently. 
Anyone been to Dubai or London? Or so when you go into these new um, these uh, uh, newer uh, airports, they have now biometric. Uh, passport control. Use your fingerprint or use facial recognition. And the reason we use those technologies is that a camera, for example, doing facial recognition is 50 times more accurate at being able to detect whether you are the person that's in the photograph in your passport than a human. So if you've got a human customs officer sitting there looking at your passport and looking at your, your picture like that, they, they will make 50 times the errors of a software program that does that same task. So you think about that. What's the riskiest thing a bank does today? Ask you to come into a branch and open an account with a signature. Because we have technology that will exceed a human at doing identification every single time already, and we're not using it. So, Every bank in the future will eliminate signature because that's the only way you can get revenue in real time through these devices. We're already starting to see this shift. This is Weibo. Uh, this is a Chinese uh, deposit product produced by Alibaba. And uh, you know, they raised 93 billion in deposits on mobile phones. This was huge. But the problem is not just about the design and behavior. It's about the way we think about banking and integrated into our life. So a lot of banks have been going for the branch of the future, trying to redesign their branches. But it's not a design problem. It's a behavior problem. So we're starting to think about this shift. This is what Jack Ma says about how we have to think about designing these businesses in the future. An honorable great job and blah, blah, blah. So we, I said uh, maybe in 10 years we'll be bigger than Walmart. You said, young man, you have a good hope. <laughs> so we said, make a map, bet. I yeah. think in 10 years we'll be bigger than Walmart on the sales because if you want to have 10,000 new customers, you have to build a new warehouse and this, that. For me, two servers. So this is how fintech startups and technology companies think about this problem today. If I want 10,000 new customers, I need two new servers. But if you want 10,000 customers, if, you're a, if you need a bank branch or you need a warehouse, it's a very, very different economic proposition. So this changes the way we think. Now, branches aren't going to disappear. We'll probably have about half the branches we do today in 10 years. But they'll look differently. They'll, they'll be infused with technology. They'll be designed for smaller spaces. And ATMs as well will change to get access to cash. This one on the left is an example of an ATM that doesn't have a screen. So how do you get money out of an ATM that doesn't have a screen? It turns out you have a screen in your pocket. So this is an ATM designed to work with your mobile phone. You put in the amount of money you want on your phone and just get the, uh, the cash out of this. So what are you going to use a branch for in five or 10 years' time? Think about this. If you can get access to investments on your phone and advice on your phone and you can pay with your phone, why would you go into a bank branch? Probably the leading reason you go into the branch is if some, for some reason this isn't working. If you can't get access to your money, you go and try and fix the technology in the branch. And this is sort of like the genius bar concept in Apple. So how does a bank change to integrate this technology into their ecosystem? Well, I thought I'd try and find an example of a bank here in Beirut that's doing that, that's making that shift. And this is an example of Bank Audi in terms of how they're infusing technology into the day-to-day -day banking experience. Remember this, even in those days, Bank Audi was ahead of the times, offering free dial-up internet to clients and being the first to offer a PC loan. Innovation has always been at the heart of our values. Today, Bank Audi continues to revolutionize the Lebanese banking sector with a series of clever, useful, and innovative products. With you in mind, we have introduced the futuristic e-branch, Novo Smart ATM, drive through Teller, interactive teller machine, state-of-the-art mobile and online banking, Audi e-payment, tap-to-pay technology, 3D secure, and the first artificially intelligent humanoid robot in the region, Novot. Even behind the scenes, Bank Audi has been going through a transformation program to improve its efficiency, productivity, and performance, all for the purpose of facilitating your banking experience. 
Today, a new milestone has been reached as we introduce you to a new first, the Omnichannel. Omnichannel transforms the traditional banking module into a customer-centric digital ecosystem. It seamlessly integrates the bank's digital communication products to conveniently provide a unified user interface across multiple channels. Your trusty smartphone, your home desktop, your friend's tablet or the nearest ATM, they will all offer you the same customer experience, in-app navigation and banking services. So even if your kid takes over your phone, you will be able to finish any transaction started on any other device. However, this is just a gateway to our first of its kind service in the region, video banking, an individually personalized service that allows you to connect with our advisors via a live video call and performs various transactions. Working overtime, stuck in traffic, enjoying your time outdoors, we have the perfect fix. Simply pull out your device, connect with one of our advisors anytime, anywhere. So there you go, tomorrow's banking today. With this newest milestone, Bank Audi will be the first bank in the region to give more choices, more freedom, and more flexibility for quick and convenient banking solutions. Thank you. Now, you might think that because you're in Beirut or you're in Lebanon, and you know, traditionally called a developing economy, that you can't compete with the US and all of this sort of stuff in terms of this future. But the reality is, every leading bank and every leading financial institution in the world will be technology-based. So it's very important to see this sort of shift that we're seeing with Bank Audi becoming a technology company instead of a bank. In fact, the leading fintech in the world isn't based in the US, it isn't based in the UK or Germany or Australia or Singapore, it's based in China, and it's Alipay's Ant Financial, a $60 billion fintech startup. That means they're as big as Citibank, they're four times as big as Deutsche Bank, and they're a technology company. They're not a bank. They're a technology company. Every leading bank, every leading healthcare company, every leading agricultural company, every leading pharmaceutical company in 10, 15 years time will be a technology company first. Now, as we make this shift, we need a new underlying infrastructure for this. And Bitcoin and blockchain, or blockchain more specifically, that powered Bitcoin, is really going to be the operating system of these new technologies. And uh, we see companies like R3 and others working on these technologies to connect banks today. But I thought I'd give you one last illustration to finish off today, to sort of show you about how all this comes together. So I, I don't know if Woz is going to talk about this later, but Apple was developing this uh, autonomous vehicle, electric vehicle. I don't know, so it, it may, maybe it's sort of like the worst kept secret in Silicon Valley. But now there's reports that maybe they're going to can that project. But imagine in 10 years or 15 years time, you're part of a group that owns this self-driving electric vehicle. It drops you off at work in the morning, and then what does it do for the rest of the day? Well, it signs on to Uber and says, hi, I'm an AI vehicle, I'm an autonomous vehicle, I'm free to drive for Uber. So for three or four hours, it drives for Uber, picking up passengers, dropping them off, and then it has to go and recharge. So it finds one of these robot snakes that Elon Musk has developed, um, and, or it goes to a wireless charging pad, it charges up, and it gets back on the road to pick you up at the end of the day. Now, while it's driving for Uber, and it's, getting, and it's recharging electricity, it has a wallet or a, you know, a purse inside the car so it can get paid by Uber. It can pay for the electricity. That's a bank account. But you know, that's a bank account that the car owns. So how do you get a car to sign a signature card to open a bank account? And what about all those AIs that we have in our home? The fridge that can order groceries, the artificial intelligence that's better than our phone or in our home that can book a restaurant, book travel for us. How does that bank account differ from the bank accounts we have today? It couldn't be more different. The future is about embedding these technologies in our life, and it's gonna be a massive change, the way we behave and the way businesses are designed. And it's all based on your experience in the moment, surrounded by technology. That's the future. If you want to know a little bit more about what's happening in banking and fintech in the future, check out my new book, Augmented, Life in the Smart Lane. 
and uh, also listen to my podcast radio show called Breaking Banks. Thank you very much for your time today. Thank you very much. Thank you. One minute. Okay, sure. Brett King is Bang King, right? Ha, 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 good. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thanks, Steve. Good. Right, okay, um, that was awesome. Um, Steve Wozniak, I've just spoken to him backstage. I can't believe I said that anyway. Uh, he seems like an amazing guy. We've got some good questions for him after he's done his presentation. So it will begin at 11 o'clock sharp. So don't move your, lose your shit seats, but it will begin at 11 o'clock. So I hope it's going to be awesome. I think it is. Thank you very much. <laughs>